Happy Sabbath. Um, amen. Make sure you say your amens nice and loud, okay? Uh, it's good once again to, to uh, be here with you today. I pray uh, that uh, you're going to catch a glimpse of, of God's care for us this morning. I've entitled the message this morning... The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. How many of you have read the Sermon on the Mount before? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, seeking your face. Open our eyes. Help us to behold wondrous things out of your holy book. Speak to our hearts, Lord. Draw us to the cross, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Sermon on the Mount, I believe, will be the most talked about sermon throughout all of eternity. In fact, I believe that the Sermon on the Mount, uh, by far, was Christ's most powerful sermon. You may have read this sermon before and uh, found very good principles in that sermon, but you're probably wondering, I've read this sermon, how can, that, how can this sermon be... Um, the sermon that, we, that will be spoken about throughout all eternity. I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Now, uh, generally when, when I mention the title of this particular message, um, there's a tendency to... Just kind of shut your minds down because I've read this before. So I'm going to invite you not to do that today. Amen? I want to invite you to, to, to uh, approach this parable as though you have never, oh, I'm sorry, this, this uh, story as though you have never read it before. Let's begin with Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set his disciples came unto him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 and 2 is so rich that I can get excited right now you're saying pastor the Sermon on the Mount has not begun yet this is just the introduction and I understand that we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. If you have Jesus' words in red letters, just let me see your hands. You have his word in red letters? Okay. So you'll know that, that the, the Sermon on the Mount begins in what verse? Verse 3. This is where Christ begins to what? To speak. Okay. But verse 1 says, seeing the multitude, he went up into, the, into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, and then begins the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I know that we said we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount, but right now we're going to skip the entire Sermon on the Mount. So, let's go ahead and just roll your eyes down all the way through to chapter 5. All those words are in red letters. That means that when you get to the end of chapter 5, all of that is what, everyone? The... Sermon on the Mount. You get to chapter 6, you'll see the red letters pick up, and you go all the way through chapter 6, and all of this is the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, you go ahead and continue all the way through, 
And when you get down to the end of the chapter, you'll see there that Matthews 5, 6, and 7 is all the Sermon on the Mount. Look how Christ ends this sermon. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So Christ, after he delivers the Sermon on the Mount, then says, Not everyone that what? Saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that saith, but he that what? doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. So Jesus closes the Sermon on the Mount with this analogy of, listen, it's not about saying, it's about what? Doing. Now, he is about to close the Sermon on the Mount with a parable. Here is the parable, beginning in verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and... Do it then. So, once again, it was not just about hearing and saying, but doing, okay? Whosoever hears and does, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. I want to suggest to you that Christ is found in this parable. Remember? Wherever we study, we ought to be looking for who? Jesus. Now, where do you think Jesus is in this parable? Okay, most of you have said the rock. And, and of absolutely, Jesus himself is known as the rock. But I want to suggest to you that Jesus is somewhere else in this parable. Jesus... I would like to suggest to you this morning, is the wise man in this parable. You say, Pastor, the wise man. Well, how so? What does that mean? Remember, the wise man builds his house upon a rock. Listen, go with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's take a look at verses 5 through 8. 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. Okay. Who is built up a spiritual house? Who? We are. You are lively what? Stones built up a spiritual house. So here's a question. If we are a house, then who's the builder? Who's the builder? Jesus. Jesus is the wise man in this parable that builds his house. Are you with me so far? In other words, builds his church upon a rock. Listen as we read on. A spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and him that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious, 
But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And the stone of what? Stumbling and the rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient. So we're told here in 2 Peter chapter 5 that, that the house or the stone, rather, uh, was a stumbling block of offense. Let's, let's, let's recap this. The house, or Christ, is the wise man who builds his house, or the church, but the chief cornerstone upon which the church is built is a rock of offense or stumbling to them which were disobedient. Now, who were those that were disobedient? Who were those that rejected Christ? It was his own people, okay? So we want to get a little bit more specific. What is it that caused them to stumble? What is it that, 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 that they did not accept about the Messiah? Go with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 23. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23. The Bible says, But we preach Christ, what? Crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Jews a stumbling block. Let's put this all together. Christ is the? wise man who builds his house or the church upon a rock. That rock, that cornerstone was a stumbling block and Paul tells us that the stumbling block was Christ crucified. In other words, beloved, Christ is the wise man who builds his house or his church upon the foundation of himself crucified. Are you with me so far? Now, go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. We are studying the Bible this morning. Is that okay? Matthew chapter 16. Notice with me verse 16. Matthew 16. We're going to read from verse 16 to 18. Listen to what the Bible says here. I say also unto thee, thou art Peter... And upon this rock, now pause right here. Do you remember what had just happened? Jesus and Peter were speaking, and Peter said, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, the Son of God. And then Jesus says to him, thou art, he says, uh, 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 um, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this what? Rock, I will, I will build my church. Upon what rock? The confession that Peter had just made. You are the Christ. Christ says upon this rock. Upon this confession, I will build my church, and the gates of what? Hell shall not prevail against it. So our question this morning is, did the church, was the church actually founded upon this confession? Go with me to the book of Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, a little bit of background. Jesus has just been crucified. Mark chapter 15. And at the cross, there is a Roman soldier. And I want you to notice what happens. Mark 15, verse 39. The Bible says, And when the centurion which stood so, cried out, 
I'm sorry, when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, or what? What did he do? He died. He said, truly, this man was the son of God. Do you remember what Peter's confession was? You are the Christ. Now watch this. Jesus dies. Question, when was Jesus' church formed? When was it birthed, if you will? When was the New Testament church birthed? Where? It was birthed at the cross. I shared this last night. Do you remember how Adam received his wife? How did Adam receive his wife? He was put to what? Sleep, and his side was opened up. And his bride comes out of his side. <laughs> Jesus, the second Adam, is put to sleep at the cross. So the church, his side opened up. And out of his side, out of his death, comes the bride. Now, this Roman centurion is the first person to make this confession upon Christ's death. In other words, we might say the church began with this confession. Now, I believe this Roman centurion knew who Jesus was. He had heard him speak before. He had what? heard him speak before. I'm sure everybody had heard Jesus. But, but the Roman centurion was not fully convinced, even though he may have or at least heard rumors of Jesus' talks. It was not until the Roman centurion saw Jesus dead that he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. Would you like for people to say about you, truly, <laughs> would you like for people to say about you, truly, this is a man of God? Guess what? Jesus talked. The Roman centurion, okay, good words, interesting words. But not until the Roman centurion saw Jesus live out, demonstrate by action. Okay, okay. So whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man that built his house. How many of you follow me? <laughs> Christ is the wise man that built his house upon a rock. Why? How? Not just by saying, but by doing. Beloved, if you want people to see you as a genuine Christian, it's not enough to just talk the talk. Amen. It's not enough to just, to just know the, the, the doctrines and, and, and know, you know how to answer this question and that question. You have to live what you're preaching. Amen. You have to live what you're teaching. You have to live what you're studying. You have to... You want people to really believe that you're a Christian? You have to die. When you die, people will say, truly. You understand what I'm saying? When self is dead, people will say, ah, truly, this man was a son of God. Do you know, have you ever seen a dead person, like, you know, on this, maybe in a car accident or something, and, you know, the ambulance comes, and what do they do with that dead person before they haul them off? They, they cover them, don't they? 
Cover them with a white sheet. Anybody want to be covered? In a white sheet? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. The white sheet is only for the dead. Do you want Christ's righteousness? Yes. He will only put it on you if you are dead. Amen. You want to scare somebody? Get under a white sheet and then move. <laughs> Do you know why people are so terrified of Christians? Because that's what they're seeing. People who claim to be dead and are yet really what? Alive. Christ is the wise man that builds his house upon a rock. Not only was that rock Christ's confession, I'm sorry, the confession of, or, or, or his, his death, I should say, not only was that rock the cross, the chief cornerstone where Christ died, where he built his church. Beloved, I want you to think carefully. Where, where did Christ die? He died on a cross, but where was the cross? Where was it placed? Golgotha, a place called Calvary. Do you know what Calvary is? It's a rock. Just wait here for a moment. <laughs> Christ <laughs> is the wise man who built his house Upon the rock. Amen. <laughs> you keep going. <laughs> Upon the rock of Calvary. <laughs> Review and Herald, June 7th, 1887. She says, he, that is Christ, laid the cornerstone upon the blood-stained rock of Calvary. Calvary. Beloved, the reason why Christ's church will stand through the rain and through the storm and through the floods is because it is built upon the death of Jesus Christ. Not only is the church built upon the death of Christ, go with me to the book of John, chapter 19, verse 41. John, chapter 19, verse 41. John 19, verse 41, the Bible tells us, John 19, verse 41, it says, Now, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. Where was Christ buried? He was buried in a sepulcher. Can anyone tell me what a sepulcher is made out of? Beloved, listen carefully. The church of Christ is not only built upon his death, it is also built upon his burial. Upon this rock will I build my church. And watch this. The gates of hell... shall not prevail against it. Now, gates of hell, pastor, what are you talking about? Go back with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, and I want you to notice something. In Matthew 16, we had read this verse a little bit earlier. Matthew chapter 16, beginning again with verse 16, you'll remember that Jesus tells Peter, upon this rock I will build my house, verse 18 rather, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Okay? So he's just told him that he's going to build his house upon this rock. And now listen, Jesus begins to explain to Peter exactly what he's talking about. Notice with me verse 21. From that time forth began Jesus 
to show unto his disciples that he must go into Jerusalem and do what? Suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and then what? Raised again the third day. So watch this. Peter, Jesus tells Peter, Peter, upon this rock I'm going to build my house. And then he says, listen, let me tell you plainly, I'm going to die at Calvary. That's where I'm going to build my house. He tells Peter this. And then Peter turns around and says to him, Far be it from thee, O Lord, you will not surely die. In other words, what Peter was ignorantly saying was Christ, no, don't build your church. Christ said, I'm going to build my church. It's going to be built upon my death and burial. And I'll be raised again the third day. Jesus says, far be it from you to die. Now, what does Jesus respond to Peter? How did he know it was Satan? Do you remember what Satan told Eve in the garden? You shall not surely die. Beloved, listen very carefully. Anytime you hear a voice telling you that you don't have to die, live a little, have some fun, why crucify self? You know who it is speaking, amen? Amen. But Jesus says, the gates of hell shall not do what? Prevail against it. Go with me to the book of Matthew 27, verse 65. Matthew 27, verse 65. Matthew 27, verse 65. Something interesting here is happening. Jesus is dead. He's buried. The Jews come to Pilate and say, Pilate, listen, um, verse 63, we remember that the the deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, a what, everyone? A watch, go your way and make it as sure as you can. So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. A great stone is rolled over the tomb of Jesus, the stone. A seal is put upon that stone. And Pilate says, You have a watch. Now, what is a watch? I want you to listen. It is a Greek word, custodia, from which we get our English word, custody. You know when you have someone in custody? You see, Jesus was being held in custody. You have a watch. Go and make it Sure, now the definition of the word custody, which is a Roman sentry, listen, it is this. A sentry is a soldier standing guard at a point of passage such as a gate. Upon this rock, Peter, I will build my church. Okay, you're going to make me get excited, alone, by myself. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell (laughs) shall not prevail against it. So, so, please, get the picture here. The Roman sentry is now surrounding the tomb, and upon the rock, there is a seal. Now, what does a seal represent? A seal represents authority, amen? Authority, and something that cannot be what? Changed or altered. Very interesting here. 
This Roman, this seal was the Roman seal. But according to Bible prophecy, uh, the book of Revelation 12 speaks about the dragon who went after Jesus, right? And the Bible tells us that this dragon that went after Jesus uh, tried to destroy him but failed. Okay, now, who does the dragon represent? Okay, in its very literal sense, who was the power that went after Jesus when he was alive? Rome, okay? So the seal represents Roman authority. But in a greater sense, Rome was only a puppet of who? Satan. So that seal on the stone. Okay. <laughs> That seal on the stone, in a greater sense, symbolized whose authority? Satan's authority. Keep him in the tomb. Do not let him out. The Roman guards and demonic guards are standing. But Jesus said, I will build my house upon this rock and the gates of Hell. Now, question, what is hell? Come on, seven dead minutes, what is hell? According to the Bible, uh, hell is the what? Grave. So what Jesus was saying, not, I mean, hell will, will be burning, not yet, but as of now, hell is the grave. So what Jesus was saying was the gates of the grave. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. And... Let me share with you so you get the picture of what it means to sit upon the stone. My older brother is 6'9". He's uh, six years older than me. When I was a teenager, uh, around 12, 13, um, five, eight, my brother was 6'9", back then. And you know, brothers get into fights. And my brother would, he would just irritate me. And, and I'd get mad, at, you know, he made me cry. <laughs> he cry. And I'd, I'd go to fight him, right? And these, this is how our fights usually went. Um, I would be swinging. And he'd have, his, he'd have his hand on my head. And he'd be laughing, and I'm just, oh, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you, right? And then I'd always say, you know what, when I turn, like when I uh, get 18, then I'm going to be your height too, and then it's going to be on, it's going to be over. I never got there. <laughs> but that's how our fights would be. And then he'd be laughing, laughing, laughing. And after a time of laughing, he would then just pick me up. He'd put me on the ground, and then he'd sit on me. <laughs> the angel sat. I know. You didn't. Ah. The angel sat on the stone. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Can you imagine the cheer that must have went up when the angel, not just for good measure, after he rolled the stone away, then sat? Heaven must have been like, <sighs> <laughs> uh, Beloved, listen to me. That angel seated on the stone symbolizes that the gates of hell cannot hold you. Amen. What hell are you living in right now? Remember. There was an angel seated at the stone. The church of Christ is built upon this thing, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is why the church will not fall. Now, if you don't want to fall, what do you need to be built upon? You 
need to be standing firmly on this theme. Christ crucified, Christ buried, Christ risen. He is inviting us, beloved, to stand upon that rock because when we do so, do you realize the reason why the church of God is still here? Even though the, the floods came, you know when the dragon sent out the flood after the woman for 1260 years? You know why she's still here despite the flood? Because she was built upon a rock. When the rains descend, when the winds are let loose, when those four angels let go of those four winds, the church of God will stand because it is built upon a rock. Now, beloved, in order to better understand this concept of Christ setting free, by the way, when he opened the gates of hell, you know what he was doing? He was setting captives free. In order to understand this, I want you to go with me to the book of Daniel because this concept of the gates of hell is actually taken from a story found in Daniel. Go with me to the, bo to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Daniel Chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. The Bible says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, brass, iron, wood, and stone. What's going on here? Belshazzar, which is the king of who? Of what? Babylon decides that he is going to mock God. And how does he mock God? He takes the vessels out and parades them before his people. Hmm. While this is going on, while they're drinking, notice what happens in verse 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosed, and his knees smote one against another. Why is this going on? While Nebuchadnezzar, or while Belshazzar is, is having this feast, Belshazzar is actually under siege. How many of you knew that? Did you know that? Who was he under siege by? A man by the name of Cyrus, king of the Medo-Persian Empire. Remember, Medo-Persia overthrew Babylon, okay? So watch this. Cyrus, Cyrus is outside the city walls, okay? And, and, and Belshazzar is pretty secure because he knows that Babylon is surrounded by the river Euphrates. It, all, it, it, it seems impregnable. However, the word of God had prophesied hundreds of years earlier that Cyrus would penetrate Babylon. You want to read about it? Let's go to the book of Isaiah 45. Isaiah 44 and 45. We'll go to 44 first. Isaiah 44. Isaiah 44, beginning with verse 27. The Bible says here, uh, let's look at verse 26. That confirmeth the word of his servants and of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem. Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. That safe to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up thy rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and the temple, thy foundation, shall be laid. Now, get, get the story here, okay? 
Jerusalem or Israel is being held captive by who? By Babylon. While they're having this feast, Israelites are captive to Babylon. And Belshazzar, the king of Babylon. But Cyrus, it is prophesied that Cyrus would come and set the Israelites free so that they could return to Jerusalem and build the temple. How would he do this? The Bible says he would dry up the deep. Are you with me so far? If you're with me so far, just say, I'm with you. Because when I share this, if you weren't with me, you're going to be really upset that you weren't with me. You're going to come and say, Pastor, can I get your notes? I'll give you my notes. Don't shut down, though. You're with me? So, so, so Cyrus was going to dry up the deep, meaning he was going to dry up the river Euphrates. Do you know how he actually entered into Babylon that night? He took rocks. That's interesting. <laughs> and he began to build a wall in the riverbed. So it diverted the rivers. And then he descended into the riverbed. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. Now pause right here. That's kind of strange. That God, as he's speaking about Cyrus, calls him, number one, his shepherd, and then number two, his anointed. Hmm, you know what the word anointed means? It means Messiah. Huh. Could it be that Cyrus was a type of Jesus. Watch this. Whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him, I will loose the loins of kings. Remember what happened to Belshazzar when he saw the writing on the wall? His loins were loosed. Watch. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Wow. <laughs> Well, so watch this. Cyrus, as Belshazzar thinks he's comfortable in his impenetrable dominion, Cyrus is outside the city walls. He diverts, he dries up the deep and descends into the riverbed. He opens up the gates and enters into Belshazzar's dominion. While this is going on, there is a writing on the wall. Babylon, um, uh, they can't read it. No one understands it. Uh, it's, by the way, it's by an unseen hand. They bring in who? Daniel. And Daniel says, this is the meaning of the, of the, of the dream. Uh, your kingdom is numbered, has been found, uh, weighed in the balance, and is finished. Your kingdom is finished. <laughs> and so, when Babylon falls, Cyrus makes a decree. And the decree is found in 2 Chronicles 36. Just write it down for the sake of time. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 22 and 23. Cyrus says, Whosoever there be of you that will go up to build the house of the Lord, go up. You're now free. <laughs> Woo! Belshazzar, beloved, is a type of who? Leave, all of you. No, 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 I'm just kidding. Belshazzar is a type of Satan. Belshazzar is secure in his dominion. He is safe, and he decides he's going to mock God. How is he going to do it? He's going to take one of the most treasured, no, the most treasured vessel, Jesus Christ, and mock him. 
That was the line. He brings him to the cross, and there he is mocking Christ. Little does he realize, watch this, Christ is a type of Cyrus, or Cyrus, rather, is a type of Christ. In fact, do you remember when Christ came, after he came back from the wilderness, and he comes and he sits in the temple, and the Bible says that he opened up the, the, the scriptures, and he began to read? And what did he read? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to pre preach deliverance to the... Do you know where that's taken from? Isaiah 61. Do you know what Isaiah... Do you know who Isaiah 61 is talking about? Cyrus! <laughs> Jesus announces his mission as though he's saying, Cyrus is here. Here I am. What is his mission? It is to set the captives free. So watch this. While Satan is mocking Jesus, he sends him <laughs> Christ is being crucified outside the city walls. Outside the city walls, Christ in his death descends. Man. <laughs> descends into the devil's dominion, opens up the gates. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> At the same time this is going on, an unseen hand. Tears the veil in the temple. <laughs> Listen to what we're told by the spirit of prophecy. It was not the hand of the priest that rent from top to bottom the gorgeous veil that divided the holy from the most holy place. It was the hand of God. When Christ cried out, it is finished. Your kingdom is numbered and finished, a writing on the wall, unseen hand. Christ cries out, it is finished, an unseen hand tears the veil. Are you seeing this? <laughs> when Christ cried out, it is finished, the holy watcher that was an unseen guest at Belshazzar's feast. She says, the same hand that traced on the wall the characters that recorded Belshazzar's doom and ended the Babylonian kingdom rent the veil of the temple from top to bottom. Wow. Beloved, every time I study the cross, I don't know about you, but it makes me just fall in love with Jesus more. You know, like, man, you're my hero. Like, Jesus, that was deep. I like that. How you did that? Whew. I mean, God is so good. He lays out for us the pattern of how he's going to work centuries before he does it. And then when he does it, he says, I just told you, I just wanted you to know, I gave that story to you so that when I did it, you could recognize that I am the Cyrus of God. And so Christ through his death, burial, and resurrection, sets us free, but he doesn't just set us free so that we can relax. He sets us free for a very specific purpose. He sets us free so that we can build and finish the temple of God. Why doesn't the house fall? Because it's built upon a rock. Christ sets us free because he has something that he needs us to do. Well, beloved, I, 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 I want to share this with you because when we look at Christ's example, in fact, do you remember what the prophecy stated about a house being rebuilt? 
God's house being rebuilt? It's found in Daniel chapter 9. You all should know this. You know, that 70-week prophecy. Remember that prophecy? 70 weeks are determined upon you and your people. And it all talked about how the sanctuary was going to be what? Rebuilt. Rebuilt and ultimately cleansed. I want you to notice the work that was to be done. Go with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. You say, Pastor, are we still talking about the Sermon on the Mount? Absolutely. <laughs> Daniel 9, verse 25. Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 25. The Bible says here, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. <coughs> Excuse me. The streets <coughs> shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Please. I want you to notice four things here that we just read. Remember? Cyrus had set the people free so that they could begin the work of doing what? Rebuilding the temple or the house. Remember, who is the wise man in our parable? Jesus Christ. Christ is a wise man that builds his what? House upon a rock. So listen carefully. Thank you. There were four things that were to be done to complete the house. This is absolutely not only amazing, but beloved, you need to pay attention. Because how many of you want to go home? You want to go? No, no, no. Oh, oh. <laughs> not home, home. <coughs> Are you bored? No. How many of you want to go home? Amen. But in order for us to go home... The work must be finished. When God's house is completed, when everything he desires to be built is built, what happens? The Shekinah glory comes and fills the place. You want the Shekinah glory to come? We got to finish. We got to be aware of the work that's going on and what needs to be done in order for it to be finished. Amen? So, so watch this. There were four things to be done for the house, for the building of God to be completed. Number one, we're told that Jerusalem was to be rebuilt. Number two, the temple itself was to be rebuilt. This is not in order, but Jerusalem, the temple, the streets, and the wall. Repeat that with me. The temple, the city, the street, and the wall. I want to share with you that Christ accomplished all of this at the cross. Amen. The temple. When you think of the temple, what is that place, the, be the most holiest place in the temple? Where is it? It's in the most holy place. There's something interesting about the most holy place that I want you to get here very quickly. The most holy place held the throne of God. And wherever the throne of God is, there you have God's kingdom. It represents his what? Authority. Are you with me so far? Yes. God's authority or his kingdom is wherever his throne is. Now, you remember that Satan challenged God's what? Kingdom, right? He challenged his, his authority, his throne, and as a result, Satan was cast out of heaven. Now God proceeds to create planet Earth, and in Earth he creates the Garden of Eden, and in the Garden of Eden he, he puts something that is the sign of his authority. Who knows what that thing was? You got it. The, the tree of life. The tree of life. That tree of life represented God's authority. In fact, the tree of life, we are told, was in the midst of paradise. 
Are you with me? So watch this. Wherever you find the tree of life or God's throne, there you find paradise or God's kingdom. Now, when Adam and Eve sinned, something happened. You'll remember that God curses the ground. Do you remember that? Yeah. Now, why did he curse the ground? It's very, very simple. The reason God cursed the ground was because he was now using the ground as a symbol of man's carnal mind and heart. You know when the Bible tells us about, you know, stony ground? Or, 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 or you know, the thorns and the thistles that began to grow out of the earth? It's a representation of, you know, before man sinned, the earth was what? Perfect, right? It was reflecting the perfect nature of God and the perfect nature of man. But now when man sinned, what happened? The earth, the ground began to grow thorns and thistles. It's representative of our human hearts and our minds. So the ground became cursed, representing man's carnal mind. God's desire, therefore, would be to reestablish the throne of his authority where? On earth. So when Jesus comes to earth, his plan is to replicate, is to reproduce the throne room scene. You remember God's throne? By the way, when you looked at God's throne, you remember that, and if you look in the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant. What was inside the Ark? The law of God. And what was on top of the ark? The mercy seat, right? And then on either side you had the covering cherubs. Okay, so, so Christ's mission was to reproduce the throne room scene on earth. <laughs> I need to take a drink. Ellen White tells us <clears throat> she says this it's interesting when Jesus was telling his disciples that he was going to set up a kingdom on earth and, and they were excited about that remember and or he was going to set up his kingdom the kingdom of God has come and they were excited but then Jesus turns around and says except the kernel of wheat fall into the ground and die it abideth alone but if it die it bears much fruit and he was talking about his death and the disciples couldn't get it God how are you talking about setting up your kingdom when you're not talking about dying that doesn't make sense to me how does that add up listen to what Ellen White says Review and Herald June 5 1900 she says as his prophetic eyes saw the results of his sacrifice Christ exclaimed, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And now if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. In the place where Satan has his seat, there will I set my cross. Now what, what does a seat represent? Throne, authority. In the place where Satan has his throne, there I'm going to set my cross. Hmm, what in the world is he talking about? Listen, where did Jesus die? Place called Golgotha. Anyone know what the word Golgotha means? Place of a what? Skull. Question, question, think about this. Could it be possible that the skull-shaped hill of Calvary would symbolize or represent the combined human and demonic hatred against Jesus? What do you think? <laughs> This is the place where humanity demonstrated its what? Hatred against Jesus. She says, in the place where Satan has his seat, there I will set my cross. Could it be that Jesus came to die on this earth, to die at Calvary, to redeem our carnal minds wouldn't it be nice to have the cross of christ planted firmly in your mind you know what christ came to, to do when he died he came to write his law in our what in our hearts and in our minds so picture this with me 
Imagine that skull-shaped hill, Calvary. Imagine that's your head. You got it? And in your head, when you look at Calvary, Christ wants to write his what? His law in your, in your mind. It's almost like your mind is to become the ark of the covenant. Now, if your mind is to become the Ark of the Covenant, what did we find on top of the Ark? <laughs> wait, wait. Do you know that when Jesus died on the cross, when he was on the cross, did you know that his cross had a seat? Okay, I guess you didn't. The seat is called a sedulum. So that when a, when, a, when a person is being crucified, if they were just nailed to the cross, they wouldn't be able to, you know, hold themselves. They would just kind of fall. The nails, they would, their flesh would rip, and they would just fall off the cross. So there had to be a seat upon which the victim sat. Christ comes to reproduce the throne room scene at Calvary. Beloved, at the cross, Christ is sitting on his throne. Do you remember what was written over his head? King of the Jews. Christ is seated on his throne. There's a reason why the devil was trying to get him to come down. Jesus knew I can't come down because I'm on my throne. Mercy seat, Ark of the Covenant. On either side of him, Check this out, beloved. In heaven, there were two angels. One was for God, and the other turned against him. See, I'm telling you, you guys are kind of like zoning. Okay, oh, what did I just miss? <laughs> I'm telling you. I'm telling you. One was for him, one was against him. Beloved, at the cross, Christ rebuilds the throne room scene. He is seated on his, he's seated on his throne. Two, <laughs> one for him, one against him. He's wearing a crown of thorns. In fact, do you remember when the disciples came to Jesus and said, would you grant us that we might sit on your right hand and on your left hand when you come into your kingdom? No, no, no. And what did Jesus say to them? Are you sure? Are you sure you want to sit on my right hand and my left hand when I come into my kingdom? Are you sure? I don't know if you know what you're asking. Do you see why we will be studying the cross throughout all eternity? Remember that thief on the cross? Remember when, when you come into your kingdom? I know as Seventh-day Adventists, we have the comma. Comma. He didn't mean today. He meant in the future, you'll be with me in paradise. But, 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 could it be that when Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you today, <laughs> remember, wherever the tree of life is found, Wherever the tree, you understand the cross is the tree of life. Wherever the tree is found, there is God's paradise. So Christ, he sets up the paradise, he sets up the kingdom right there on Calvary. Not only does he set up the kingdom, he sets up the, the city, Jerusalem. We've already seen that because the church represents God's city, doesn't it? You are a royal nation. 
God builds the, the temple. He builds the city. And now what about the street? The word is singular. What is a street? It provides the way. Beloved, do you understand that at Calvary, the way, the truth, and the life has been provided for us? So watch this. He builds the city. He builds the temple. He builds the street. And now what about the walls? Who builds the walls? Who remembers that story? Who built the walls in Jerusalem? Nehemiah. You remember that? Check this out. Check this out. Do you know that Nehemiah, he goes up on a wall and he begins building the wall. And you know what happens? The Bible says that the enemies of Jerusalem come around and they come to Nehemiah and they try to get Nehemiah down from the wall. <laughs> Nehemiah says, I cannot come down because I am doing a great work. Do you know who Nehemiah is a type of? Jesus. Jesus is up in an exalted place, doing a great work. And by the way, do you know the Bible says that they came by four times to try to get Nehemiah to come down? Guess how many times they tried to get Jesus to come down? Four times. Here's the beautiful thing. It took Nehemiah 52 days to build the wall. 52 days. He completed the wall in 52 days. Do you know that if you count from the day that Jesus went up on the cross, if you count 52 days, do you know what you come to? You come to the day of Pentecost. Ellen White tells us that when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost, it was like a wall of fire It took Christ 52 days to build the wall around his city. Beloved, listen to me. Christ has gone to every length to provide for you a place of safety. The reason the house will not fall and those who are found in the house will not fall is because the house was built by a wise man. So when the floods come, when the storms are let go, when all these things begin to hit us, beloved, guess what? I want to be found in that house. Do you remember how we began the Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5. Matthew 5, verse 1. Are you ready? Open our eyes, Lord, that we may see. Matthew 5 and verse 1. And seeing the multitude, he went. He went up into a mountain. And when he was set, <laughs> he, oh, his disciples, are you seeing something different in this verse? Now watch this. The Bible says, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. Now watch this. Jesus begins to speak. He's on, he's on a mount. He begins to speak, right? And then he ends it by saying, now, it's not just about what I just said. It, this, what I just said, must be done. So, so, get this. Could it be that the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 was only a snapshot of the Sermon on the Mount? 
of the Sermon on the Mount found in Matthew 27, 28. Watch this, beloved. Remember Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if, if someone smite you on the cheek, turn your other cheek and give it to them. Oh, well, he had just said that, right? But now, on the Sermon on the Mount, he demonstrates it. Remember he said, look, if you're, uh, uh, pray for your enemies and pray for those who despitefully use you. He had just said those words in Matthew 5, but now he is actually demonstrating what he had preached in Matthew chapter 5. Read the entire Sermon on the Mount. Jesus demonstrates, acts it out, all on the Sermon on the Mount. Beloved, do you see why I say the Sermon on the Mount <laughs> will be the most talked about sermon in all of eternity? Jesus says, I will liken you unto a wise man how many of you want to be like that wise man? Beloved, Jesus is appealing to us today. Get into the house. Come into that place where you have a wall of protection, my Holy Spirit, where I have done the work for you. Come and abide there, and when the winds are let loose, you will be safe. How many of you desire to be safe in the house of the Lord. I want to make a very special appeal. Someone in here is outside of God's house. I don't know who you are. I don't know your back. I don't know what it is, but you are realizing today, you know what? I'm, the, I'm, out, I'm out doing something else. I have not been drawn to the cross as I should be. Lord, please have mercy on me. And you're deciding today. You're deciding today. Lord, I'm coming to the cross. I want to live in that wise man's house. I'm tired of the winds coming and always blowing me away. I'm tired of the floods always carrying me away. I'm tired of it, Lord. I want to build my house upon the sand anymore. I want to build it upon the blood-stained rock of Calvary. I want to start anew today. If there's someone here like that, would you raise your hand? Praise God. Praise God. God and the angels are rejoicing because today, beloved, you have been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's an angel seated on the stone that says, remember, you are free in my house. Go, go and finish the work I have called you to do. Let us pray. Heavenly Father. I thank you, Lord. Your word is so rich. Your word is so powerful, Lord. We have seen Christ and him lifted up. Christ and him crucified is on every page of this book. Teach us, Lord, to look for him and behold him because by beholding him, we shall indeed become changed. Teach us, Lord, that it is not enough for us to simply hear your word. We must not only hear, we must also do. Help us, Lord, to be found in that house and upon that rock is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. More faithful than I could ever